So I was talking with Bill last night, and he twitched at me. And anybody that knows Bill knows that when he twitches at you, he's about to say something portentous. So I said, what is it, Bill? And he said, great conference, isn't it, Peter? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's a great conference. What's on your mind, Bill? He said, oh, man, it, it's, really, it's really great. And, you know, my brain's already, you know, like half yeah, full. And a whole day tomorrow, I said, yeah, what are you saying? Well, you know, you're, you're the last act. And, um, you know, people's brains may be full. And, you know, you've got four points. Uh, OK, so that's pointer. And that's glue, too. And how do I make this advance? <laughs> I know, you're, this is an exp Pointed at the computer, Peter. Not hmm. not at the oh, you're brilliant. <laughs> but now I want to back it up. <laughs> OK, so back it up. More. Thank you, more. OK, now you can all go home. Now you can go home. So anyhow. OK, so what do I hit? OK, I'm the first one that needed instructions. I'm worried. You know, you're always checking yourself. And so he said you got four points. And um, I, I hit what you, that's what I hit. Yeah. Yeah, you show me. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's see you do it. So anyhow, he said you had four points. Oh, why didn't you say so? And so I said, yeah, right, I got four points. He said, well, you know, could you, could you do it in three? And I said, three? And this isn't the man that, you know, too much is never enough. Now it's getting to be less is never too little. So I said, how about two points? He said, well, yeah, yeah. Then he twitched at me again, and I said, well, what next? He said, could you sort of make it fun? And so I decided sort of to tear up the talk and throw it away. And um, I'm not going to tell you the answer. So you probably were all right in deciding what the correct answer was. I've been thinking about other issues, behavioral economics issues. And I thought I'd give you this talk, satisfy Bill at least, and maybe uh, puzzle some of you. And so I'm going to talk about a puzzle that's been around at the foundations of probability theory for um, 300 years now. Uh, its birthday will be next year. It's an amazing paradox. And paradox are, are never to be taken lightly, except in those cases where they're to be taken lightly. And I'll let you take this either way. The paradox came at the very time the whole concept of probability was evolving and getting formulated, both by the Bernoullis and by Laplace, Fermat, Pascal. And it was described by Nicolas Bernoulli, uh, one of this huge family of uh, Swiss mathematicians, um, the law of large numbers, Bernoulli, Bernoulli, uh, and Pierre de Montmort. Pierre is a curious guy also. He named himself Montmort, and I'm not sure I would have chosen that name. Um, but he also named Pascal's triangle, Pascal's triangle, which was a good naming, I think. <laughs> Um, and published a book of games on chance. And uh, here's the, uh, the, the game. Okay, the game is, I'm going to flip a coin. It'll be a fair coin. You have to take my word on that. And I'm going to let it fall. And if it comes up heads, I'm going to pay you $2. If it comes up tails, I'm going to flip it again. If it comes up heads then, I'll pay you 4 and I'm going to keep flipping it as long as I get tails. And then as soon as I get a head, I'm going to stop the game and pay you. And I'm going to pay you $2 or 4 or 8 or 16 or 32. And as soon as I pay you, that's the end of the game. You could pay to play again. Doesn't, you clearly are going to win at least 2 bucks. And so what I want you to decide is how much you will pay me to play, since I'm only a poor professor and I, I can't go away completely broke. So I want you to write down on a piece of paper how much you're willing to pay and assume that if somebody is going to pay more than you, I'll play with them rather than you. So a good number. How much are you willing to pay most to play this game? And beyond that, you're not interested. Please write that down. I want an act. I want consequences. And I want to perceive you're engaging in that act right now. Or I'm going to ask Francis to come up here again and explain what he just <laughs> explained a moment ago. OK? See, so write it down. Next, I'm going to tell you the correct answer. There is a correct answer. And then I'm going to tell you about the paradox. So the correct answer is 
Well, you calculate, it's easy. The probability of getting one head is one half. Um, and you're gonna get two bucks for it. Uh, two heads is one fourth, you'll get four bucks. Uh, three heads, one eighth, you'll get eight bucks. So the expected value of this game is the sum from n equals one to infinity of one plus one plus one plus one plus one. The expected value of this game is infinite. Strange. Next, the paradox. I would like you to take on the same sheet of paper and write down the amount that you are now willing to pay me to play the game. Uh, again, behavior. See, Michael Davison's here is modeling behavior. The rest of you are too cool, aren't you? You know, are you afraid I might check your answer? Now, I forgot to ask, look at the first number on your piece of paper. How many would have paid more than $10? Raise your hand, please. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, about a dozen people. Now, how many people would pay more than ten dollars? About three or four more joined them. <laughs> now, this is the Society for the Quantitative Analysis of Behavior. <laughs> I just proved something to you, and you weren't paying attention to me. The value is infinite. Why don't you empty your wallet? What's wrong here? Yeah, so, I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I'd let Billy do the flipping, it wouldn't work. Well, in fact, it's, it's strange that this expected value is infinite. It's paradoxical that even quantitatively numerates uh, like yourselves balk at paying more than, at uh, changing your opinion here, what's wrong? That's the paradox, why don't you change your behavior? Would you be foolish to do so? Something's wrong. This formulation is exactly correct. No one has questioned it. There's no trick here. This is expected value. So it's a paradox, which I'll give you a little bit of history about and talk about three classes of solution. And this is of relevance to those that are looking at um, gambles with uh, probabilistic payoffs because we just looked at how to calculate one in theory. The uh, classes of solution, utility, pro uh, probability, and pragmatism, um, all of those versions of solutions were current. The first one was provided by Daniel Bernoulli of Bernoulli Effect, Bernoulli fame, um, who was called to St. Petersburg by, Saint Frederick, uh, by Frederick the Great just in the nick of the time because his father, who was a bastard, they all were apparently, kicked them out of the house because they competed in the same uh, high-level prize for mathematics and they both had such good papers, they split the prize and his father was so pissed he kicked him out of the house. And, and later, Bernoulli wrote this great book in hydrology, and his father saw it, copied it, put his name on it, predated it, and sued his son for plagiarism. <laughs> so, you know, you talk about, people blandly talk about cutthroat academic politics today. They don't know. No, no. Okay. His answer is a great answer. Well, a dollar, a ducat, which is about 50 bucks worth of dollars, um, means more to a poor man than a rich man. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, it's nice to be a professor now. I can buy things, not like a graduate student. Bernoulli said the utility resulting from any small increase in wealth will be inversely proportional to the quantity of goods possessed. Laplace got his hands on that and said, oh, I can write a difference equation. I can move to a differential over here. The change in utility is proportional to the change, uh, proportional to the change in wealth, DW, divided by the wealth you currently have. Maybe that looks a little familiar to some of you. And while I explain what happens with it, I, I want Randy and I want um, Armando to work out what would happen if Laplace had said change in utility is proportional to the utility you currently have. You get another very nice utility function if you do that. Okay, so if you do that and you integrate, you come up with a logarithmic function, which is cool. Um, in fact, you've seen that before. Fechner said, oh, you can predict that from, from Weber-Fechner law you know, a couple hundred years later. Um, but he cited Bernoulli, Laplace, and Poisson. So exactly the same formulation was used by Fechner to get weber fechner's law. And probably he got it from Laplace. I mean, he did get it from Laplace and then retrofitted it to all the psychophysics data. Here's how it works. If you're a poor man in the upper right, the growth of utility or delight uh, with ducats, which are good things to have, increases logarithmically, but very steeply at first. And if you're a rich man, you see the change in axes down in the bottom right, uh, it's a much slower growth. It all makes sense. And if you apply it to St. Petersburg Gamble, you substitute for value utility, you work the equations, and you come up 
for a poor man that the um, expected utility of the gamble as a whole is three ducats. And for you, it might be three dollars, if we're talking in dollars. Perfect. OK, we well can all go home now. Elegant, beautiful. And by the way, it's also interesting that this sigma p log p um, here can be written as sigma p log p. Does anybody recognize that? Entropy. It's entropy. Yeah, it turns out utility is entropy and vice versa. Kenneth Arrow pointed that out. Um, I th it's the wrong solution. It's one of these pretty stories that's just wrong. Um, Samuelson disliked it for other reasons. Samuelson was also a very sharp-tongued economist. Read some of his stuff if you want some time. He, he had no time for fools. And, and he went on to say, few economists today will swallow Bernoulli's gratuitous postulate, but to novitiate such argumentation apparently carries some plausibility, as with the weber fechner law and experimental psychology. He had different reasons for liking it, but you know, here are some of mine. Did you calculate utility when you were trying to do this? I don't, I don't think so. Now, maybe some did. OK, Michael did. <laughs> well, you always are doing that. Uh, but you, know, you might have unconsciously, whatever that means. Um, but, but take a more uh, data-oriented answer. Do people gamble? Of course, they gamble all the time. Well, if you had a concave utility function and that controlled your behavior, you wouldn't gamble. Because sure money in your pocket is better than a probabilistic chance of getting, even if it's a very fair gamble, um, a probabilistic chance of, say, one-tenth or one-hundredth of something a thousand times as great, you're still better off with money in your pocket. People gamble. Therefore, what's driving behavior is not a utility function, even though people have used that explanation for ages. But even more fundamentally, there's a problem with the derivation. Can anybody see? And this is the classic one. My version of it, but it's the classic one. You're going to win a thousand bucks or the lotto, a million bucks. Can we use this? Can we use this model? No, we can't. We can't use it because it's saying, I'm going to give you a million bucks. It doesn't say, I'm going to increase your wealth bit by bit by bit by bit by bit. You can't use a differential if you're going to have a huge jump. That's only good in the limit of very small increments. So this could only work if I paid you the payoff a penny at a time then you might find it an applicable model. It's an adaptation level model. It's not a model for predicting what happens if I give you a whole bunch of money. What happens if, if you're worth 200 ducats and I give you 1,000, that's going to be the jump in utility because it's proportional to the amount of money you now have. I mean, the change in utility is proportional to the change in wealth, and your current wealth is that. And so this is not an applicable model. Uh, it doesn't work in terms of gambles, and it doesn't work in terms of derivation. Um, so there's that. Now, other people have put a twist on it, thinking that utility was still the thing, and offered gambles payoffs that straightened out the, the curved utility function. Menger's super St. Petersburg paradox. People still will wager only modest bets on that. So there were a lot of um, solutions involving utility. Paul Samuelson's. Um, made a really interesting argument that uh, you can't make a market in this. Anything that's worthwhile for me to let you gamble with me would not be worthwhile for you to uh, play the game and vice versa, so that it was non-pragmatic, which was cool. And Lola Lopez, I love her name, uh, has done some nice work simulating it. Um, but again, utilities, which I think is the wrong-headed way to go about it. Buffon, I said that probabilities less than 10,000 are treated as zero, as other people have, to which Keynes quoted Gibbons saying, oh, if that's the case, suppose I told you the probability of your waking in this morning, uh, of your not waking in the morning, you're going to be executed, is, is that probability. Are you going to get a good night's sleep? People don't discount zero with probabilities. They gamble on mega million dollar lottos where the probability is nil. There are other probability functions that might explain for it in theory. Like, boy, I was so embarrassed. I'm, I feel very pre pleased if a paper of mine ever gets 50 citations. Their original 72 prospect theory has gotten over 5,000 citations. Um, and they argue for a, a standard concave utility function and a probability function that comes like this. Would that solve the St. Petersburg? No, because it would actually have to come down to do the St. Petersburg. This says that you're giving credible weights to things that are very small, higher, not, uh, higher, not lower. So it can't motivate your decision not to play the game. Um, Buffon of needle fame argued that the game should be capped at 29 tosses because to pay that off would take all of the money in France. And so 
so people are not going to uh, obviously play the game because they can't get paid off. Um, and that's fine, and, but, but if you do that, cap it at that, the game is only worth about 30 bucks. And so people have argued, bounding it from above, say to Bill Gates worth, then the game was only worth 36 bucks. Or from the right, if the per like Buffon's. But these still give us huge amounts of money compared to what you guys were willing to pay, 36 bucks. And besides, that wasn't part of the game. You know, it was, a, it was a hypothetical one. Maybe we can pay it off. Keynes argued expected value is not the correct way to do it because he gave additional value to risk variance. And he said that's a, that's an orthogonal consideration that has to be brought into play when you're talking about probability. Um, and in Wikipedia, uh, the latest public uh, statement on it are the, are the points that I made. And I'm throwing in the names of the people that were relevant. And they think that these are all solutions. I think none of these are solutions. Okay? Um, and none of those resolutions explain these cool simulated data. I played the game um, 12 series of 8,000 trials. And I averaged how much you would make over the first 1, 10, 100, and so on games, all the way up. It seems that the longer you play, on the average, including all games, the more you're likely to make. Now that's interesting and weird, and where does that come from? How can that be? Uh, my resolution to the paradox is that infinite division of probability is wrong-headed. Probability has got at least three meanings or origins. One is from symmetry, like symmetry of a coin. One from is the prudential thing, you know, what's the likelihood that that person's a crook? Uh, and one is from long-run relative frequency. All have their problems. And people are thinking in terms of long-run relative frequency. And that's the wrong model for this situation, as seductive as it is. Um, because it postulates non-obtainable realities. I'm adding one dollar and one dollar one dollar. I can never pay you a dollar. Uh, you can never play a fraction of a game. It's not a realizable series. Um, so I'm arguing that the class of expected value and expected utility models some fictitious entities to achieve a fictitious solution that doesn't deliver either your behavior, which, if you look at this, was prudent not to pay a million bucks because in these simulations, the median winnings is only two or sometimes three dollars if you play one game. So you knew that somehow. You were smarter than all these people that tried to solve the problem with these. I don't know how you knew it. You all knew it. Um, so here's my solution to the problem. You only sum things that are realizable. In 8,000 games, all of them will add two dollars to your average. Half of the remaining will add four. Uh, we'll add another two dollars, half of those four, eight, until you get half of 125 games, which we add 64. But you can't play 125 games. And so what I'm going to do, instead of summing the series like in the upper right, I'm going to be summing just an integer function of that over to the right. And I only have to carry it out until the inter integer function on, on, uh, prob on expected value goes below zero. Um, goes below one because then it's fractional on the integer. And that's going to be out to log two to the log n, which is n. I'm sorry, it's going to be out to log to the base two of number of games to give expected value. So the expected value from this solution that says you only add achievable outcomes and you don't play fractional games, um, you sum that series and you get um, two plus log to the base two n. That's the expected value according to this. I call it finitary or constructivist model of probability for these. And now if you look at four of the, of the, of the series that went into the original average, you see um, it's very noisy, of course. Sometimes you start out great, and sometimes you, you get hits. Way over here in the lower right, this hit, I think it was $16,000 on the 800th play or so. They come down again because you're averaging over all these. The model I gave you gives the purple line, and the approximate model that I gave you, log, log, to the, log to base two of the number of games you played, gives the yellow line. So it captures the data. Here's 21 more games played out that way, and that's the lo log to the base two of the number of games that you play. So here's a new model of expected value in scenarios where there is sudden death 
to some of the gambles or games that ends the, ends the play. And I'm arguing in those cases, you, you cannot use expected value as a viable model. You use something that's more positivistic, more behavioristic, more um, looks only at attainable entities and you get nice predictions that I haven't seen before. Now, if you had planned to pay me $4, let's say, to pay, or let's say uh, $6, those are the purple X marks here, then, had you had the stamina and the pockets deep enough to play a dozen games, you'd start to break even. And if you kept at it for a thousand games, let's say, your average winnings would be up around 80 bucks or so. So it was prudent of you, not for those of you that denied rationality and said, no, Peter may prove expected value is infinite, but I'm not going to pay him because some of you didn't trust me, like Clive. We'll have to talk about this later. Uh, we're right. You were right. But it's not me you shouldn't trust. It's all these people that had all these great solutions that were. So all of these things may be true. Although, I don't, you know, I used to swear by utility functions. I'm not so sure about subjective utility now. All of these things be true. They're, they don't deliver the goods on predicting either your behavior in general or your behavior in this situation um, that Classical, Keynes was right, the classical, rational, expected value or expected utility model is inapplicable. Um, that we need to rethink this. And things like Weber Fechner law have been, have been used in similar incorrect ways. Um, that if you have this note, you'll lose some things uh, as you do in constructivist mathematics if you only require, like you lose, uh, in that case, uh, Gödel's uh, solution. But if you'd only permit yourself to m operate on realizable quantities, you can still calculate expected values in many cases, but not all. And that's where they're appropriate, but not otherwise. So what I'm doing is taking the long run, this whole notion of probability is a weird one, the long run relative frequency is probability. Yeah, in the long run, if you were willing to play a huge number of games, you would make a huge amount of money in this gamble. But if you crank that definition back to just one or a few games, now you also get the correct resolution that you don't make much money on it. Um, I don't know how you knew what to do. Uh, so we talked about normative versus descriptive um, and how to maximize each of those as each a story in its own way. One of the ways you might have operated is calculate the implicitly the median number of um, runs that you would get flipping heads. And that'd be two or three, it's typical. And then calculate the value of that. Maybe that's what you did. And that would give you a good answer. I don't know. Um, so I read Ray Nickerson's book while I was thinking this. He, he provoked me into thinking about this paradox. And, and other students um, were the sources of my cogitations. Um, thank you. I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> Hi, Howie. Hi. Uh, what about uh, discounting? What about discounting for delay? Does that just do the same thing as for loop? Well, that's a very good question. I, I'm starting to think about that, but I haven't tried to apply this paradox to it. We're all, there's also a paradox, we all know there's a paradox there of, of hyperbolic discounting when any rational bank would only generate uh, exponential discounting for people. A lot of reasons have given why hyperbolic discounting makes more sense, but of course that makes people a money pump. And so there's another paradox there to be solved, and I don't know what the resolution to that is. Maybe something like this, I'll have to think about it. Maybe one of you guys can figure out how to take this mode of thinking of don't believe what they say about expected value as a function of variables and apply it here. I don't know. So when I come up to you in the bar later today and say, I, hey, let's play this game. <laughs> I want you to be very rational about it, OK? To, to show that you're a good member of squab, calculate the expected value and play with me for that expected value but I'll only play with you a few times. Thank you.